Let's open our Bibles together to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, and we begin at verse 27. I would like to discuss with you today verse 27, 28, 29, and 30. That will leave one more lesson in John chapter 3, and we will ease into John chapter 4. Each of these are precious portions of Scripture. Let me read the text for this lesson. John, that would be John the Baptist. Remember, John, the writer of this fourth gospel, never mentions himself by name. If you see John in this gospel, it's John the Baptist. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness. He's talking to a group of uh, antagonists, men who oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28, Ye yourselves, you've heard me say it, You've heard me bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. John is saying, I'm the forerunner, the herald of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, that would be the equivalent today of the best man, the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him. I get that close to the bridegroom. I could stand by him and I can hear him. That friend greatly rejoices because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, Therefore, is fulfilled. And then the classic verse 30. He must increase. Jesus must increase. But I must decrease. So said John the Baptist. Uh, this section along with the next lesson comprise the last sermon that's what I want to call it. The last sermon by John the Baptist in this gospel. And oh, what a tremendous sermon is. Somebody, one commentator called it John's valedictory sermon. Mm -mm. And indeed, it is absolutely beautiful. We have joined, at verse 27, we have joined a conversation already in progress, some of which we discussed in our last lesson, let me tell you what went on uh, in verse 26. One verse before our text begins. Uh, some folks came to John and they said, uh, you know that man Jesus, the, the man that you preached about, uh, the man you said you were not worthy to untie his shoelaces, uh, did you know he and his disciples are baptizing also. Uh, did you know, this is what they're implying, he has moved in on your territory. And John, we hate to tell you, all men are coming to him. Uh, John, your discipleship numbers are dwindling. And Jesus' discipleship numbers are growing. I believe with all my heart, as I said in our last lesson, uh, that is an attempt to stir up jealousy, to stir up ill feeling between envy, John the Baptist, toward the Lord Jesus. And now, in verse 27, John answers. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Oh, oh, what a beautiful statement that is. Let's uh, common vocabulary words. Uh, the word for man is anthropos. Can 
That's, that's the uh, dunamai verb. That's the dunamis verb. Uh, uh, can receive nothing. That means not a thing. Receive, accept nothing. Uh, all I'm saying is the vocabulary is very, very typical and very normal. But the meaning of this verse is phenomenal, weighty. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven, from God, by the Lord God Almighty. This is what John is saying. You're not going to get me jealous of the Lord Jesus. God the Father gave me my ministry. I'm the, I'm the herald of the Lord Jesus. I'm the announcer that he's coming. And now he's here. And uh, uh, God the Son, oh my, he's unique. He's one of a kind. He is God personified. Uh-uh, you're not going to get me to fall for that little trick. I'm satisfied with what God has given me in my life and in my ministry. I accept gladly what has been given to me from heaven. Oh, my, my, my. Uh, John the Baptist is legitimately, biblically compared to Elijah. Uh, I think he functioned in the spirit of Elijah. He is compared in several texts to Elijah. But I want you to notice something. John the Baptist is content with his station in life. He's content to be merely, merely, oh my, the last verse. We're, we're not to it yet, but we're heading that way as fast as I can get there. He must increase. I must decrease. And, and numbers, John's numbers are going down. Jesus' numbers are going up. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I'll take whatever God gives me from heaven. I will not, I will not be envious of what God does with other preachers, other men, other Christians. Wow, what a lesson to learn. Preachers. A number of you study with us in our meditations. Uh, don't you let the devil get you upset or jealous because that friend up the road, his church is growing and your church is not. As long as you're not being lazy, as long as you're preaching the word, as long as you're trying to reach people for Jesus, uh, God may have given you the lot of life where uh, you're in a little secluded area. Don't be jealous of the man that's downtown. Don't be. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Hey, the Lord Jesus practiced that. In Psalm 16, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Oh my, I have been given a godly heritage. That's Jesus through the eye of Bible prophecy in Psalm 16. Jesus, they're going to crucify you. Oh, my Father's been good to me. They're going to nail you on a cross and, and uh, uh, they're going to yell hatred and, and uh, ugly things towards you. They're going to accuse you of being a blasphemer. Oh, my. Oh, my. I've got such a goodly heritage. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Oh, what a valuable Lesson to learn. Oh, preacher, we only have a few, but we're trying to grow, but we haven't been able. God has given you that ministry. Be happy with that ministry. Be faithful in that ministry and rejoice in your brother up the road across the state who is preaching to 10 times the people you are. We're all servants of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Verse 28. Words of wisdom from John the Baptist. Ye yourselves, he's talking to the crowd around him, the skeptics. Ye yourselves bear witness. Martyria or martyreo in this case. You can testify. You've been eyewitnesses. You bear witnesses that I have said. And John said it repeatedly. I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. Let me read that a little bit differently. 
I am not the Christ. That's ego, I me, ook, in Greek. Ego, I me, ook. I am not the Lord Jesus Christ. John says, I am not the one that's coming. He will stand here in our midst. I will announce him when he comes. I'll say, behold the Lamb of God uh, that taketh away the sin of the world. I am not the Christ. Someone said this. I like it. John the Baptist knew what he was not, who he was not, and John the Baptist knew who he was. I wish we'd quit, quit trying to be somebody that we're not. I, I wish we would uh, get over this idea that I'm not a meaningful person. I'm not successful if I'm not like uh, that individual over there. No, 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 no. He knows who he's not, and he knows who he is. I am not the Christ. I think he words it that way. Christ, Christos, the Messiah, the Son of God. I think he words it that way because Jesus, in the heart of his ministry, loved to say, Ego I me. Translated into English exactly the way our King James Version has it. I am. I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the only way to heaven. I am the truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. I am the truth. I am life. I am, and he is in John particularly, I am eternal life. John the Baptist, he doesn't claim a bunch of I ams. No, no, no. It's not about John the Baptist. It's about Jesus. I am not the Christ. Mm. Verse 28. I am not the Christ but you've heard me say it again and again, but I am sent before him. I am sent before him. The uh, uh, I am sent, the verb is apostello. It's the word apostle turned into a verb. It means commission to go commissioned to carry an official authoritative message. Uh, it means when necessary, straighten out things that are crooked, things that are wrong. Uh, I am sent. I've got the authority, but it's the gift God gave me before him, ahead of him. Now earlier, and we studied it in detail, John the Baptist gives a lot more material, a lot more depth, but I am sent before him. I'm the voice that Isaiah prophesied would come. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. King Jesus is on the way. I am he that was sent before him. Find out who you are in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you who you are. If you're born again, somebody get ready with some amens. You're a saint of God. You're a servant of God. You're a disciple of God. You're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes you important in the eyes of God. Mm. Verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. John is changing now to a word picture that sounds like a wedding, a marriage. Uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Hath is the verb, E-C-H-O, echo. He that is enjoying the presence of, holding on to, uh, is the husband of he that hath the bride. He that hath the bride, the Greek I don't know it's the most important thing in the verse, but the Greek noun there is nymphe, N-U-M-P-H-E, nymphe. It comes from the uh, Greek verb nupto, N-U-P-T-O, which means to veil the little girl at the wedding who will leave with the groom who is veiled uh, 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 in her uh, bridal gown, in her, in her wedding clothes. Uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. You fellas need to understand something. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm not the son of God. 
I'm not the Savior of the world. I am not the husband. God the Father said again and again, He's the husband of ancient Israel. John said, I'm not the husband of ancient Israel. And though John is not privy to the full details yet, John who writes the book uh, is more uh, uh, versed and, and fluent in it. I'm not the Jesus who will be the bridegroom of the bride of the New Testament church uh, uh, someday. The church hasn't come into existence yet at this, uh, at this time. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But I'm not the bride. I'm certainly, and I'm not the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. Let me give you that word for friend. Philos. Philos. P-H-I-L-O-S. It comes from the verb phileo. It means to love, to be fond of, to be the best friend to. It's that kind of an idea. Uh, I am the friend of the bridegroom. I've never seen any more genuine humility. Here it is in John the Baptist. I wish some of our preachers today, and I don't want to be critical uh, in class, I wish some of our preachers today could see the reality and the truth of that. In our churches, oh my, uh, it, 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 we ought to emphasize every Sunday, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, well, we talk about the Holy Ghost who will always magnify Jesus. Uh, well, I'm not even sure what to say. My church, my pulpit, my crowd, in the truth, it's the Lord's church. That pulpit is a place uh, uh, to honorably stand and proclaim not about me, the word of the living God. Uh, I, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. But then look what John says. Who standeth and heareth him. John says, and this is a southern expression, I probably shouldn't use it, I'm just tickled. I'm just delighted uh, to be the friend of the bridegroom. Don't you worry about me being jealous. Don't you worry about me being envious. I am honored just to be and I want to interject this. You're looking at an old boy who's simply a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a little peon in the army of the Lord. And I'm, I'm pleased. I'm delighted to be that. I'll be his servant. Lord, what would you thou have me to do? Lord, speak and I'll try to follow your command. Oh my, I'm just delighted to stand and hear him. Stand is the verb histamate. Here is a kuo. I'm just delighted to stand and to hear him. Standing is a perfect participle there. I've been standing since I got saved. I've been standing since I met and knew the Lord. I've been standing since I've been born again by grace through faith. And I started then and I'm still at it. Started then and I will continue to stand as long as God gives me breath. I'm going to stand near him. Let me tell you what I... I believe that standing implies. I think it implies being still. I think it implies cessation of unnecessary activity. I think it even implies, see if you get this word picture, zipping, my mouth closed, I will stand, I will be silent, I will be still. John said, I'm standing and I'm hearing him. You can't hear him. If your mouth is going 90 miles an hour, you can't hear him if you're busy with four other tasks. Uh, uh, reminds me of Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. That's what the Lord Almighty said. Be still and know that I am God. And that's exactly what John the Baptist, I am being still I am standing and I am hearing him. I want to hear every word he says. I, I, want to, I want to digest every statement my Savior ever makes. Hallelujah to God. I stand and I'm hearing him. Well, that could be preached in our churches. We might ought to run by that verse before uh, the evangelist gets up to preach in the revival or the pastor preaches his Sunday night sermon. Folks, get everything else out of your minds. Lay aside the cell phones. Lay aside the, uh, lay aside the uh, little, uh, uh, everything's got to go. Be still, stand, and then listen. Listen to the, be attentive to the word of God. Lord, give me ears to hear uh, the things of God. 
I'm standing and I'm hearing him. You'll never go wrong listening to Jesus. And he said, then I'm rejoicing. I'm still in verse 29. I'm rejoicing greatly. I am rejoicing greatly. Oh my, what a construction, a grammatical construction. Cairo kara. Let me, let me put that in English. Cairo kara. It's a verb and then it's a noun. He said, I'm happy, happy. I'm glad, glad. I'm rejoicing, rejoicing because of the bridegroom's voice. Because of the bridegroom's voice. The, the noun for voice there is phone, P-H-O-N-E. We get our word telephone, phone, phone, pronounced in Greek. It means the sound he's making, the truth. He's conveying the, uh, 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 the absolute doctrine that he's revealing to me. I want to learn it and I want to live it and I want to apply it. Rejoicing, rejoicing, double joy, double delight because of the bridegroom's voice. Many Bibles, I just got a, a Bible with no notes in it by my side as I pray. Many Bibles, including this one, put Jesus' words in red. I mean, they print it, you know this, in red ink. Uh, that insinuates that his words are a pair. This is all the word of God, not an error in it, divinely inspired. God put his word above his name. Psalm 138 says, but the words of Jesus, uh, they have a special place in my heart. Paul is defining, as he writes Timothy one day, wholesome doctrine clean doctrine, right Bible doctrine. And he said, right Bible doctrine. He said, I can sum it up in two ways. One of those ways, the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus. And if you want to know number two, it's the doctrine that will produce godliness and holiness and purity in your life. He said, I'm just happy, happy that I can hear the bridegroom's voice. And then verse 29 closes this my joy, this my joy is therefore fulfilled. This my joy is therefore and fulfilled means filled, not halfway full, not three quarters way, all the way to the brim, maybe running over a little on the side. My joy is bubbling over because I get to, I get to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. I'm the one that got to say he's the Lamb of God. I can't bow down and untie his shoe. I'm not worthy, uh, but I get to be a servant of Him. Uh, and my joy is bubbling over because of that. Wow. The words of Jesus produce joy. Our same gospel writer, John, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he says, These things I write unto you, the words of God, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the Gospel of John containing so many of the words of Jesus. These things I write unto you that, here's why, your joy may be full. Same construction as your, your joy may be full. Something about the Bible gives me full joy. Something about the words of Jesus gives me full joy. Hallelujah to his name. And then that last verse, he must increase but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. Remember the context. Remember, uh, even back to verse 26, uh, his numbers are growing. Your numbers are, are shrinking. Uh, John, aren't you a little bit disturbed about that? It looks like your ministry is, is dissolving. It's going, and, and uh, his is becoming greater and greater. No, 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 you, you don't understand. God gave me the little gift, I'm happy. God gave His Son uh, 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 my what the, the greatest task a man was ever given, dying for the sins of the world. Jesus said, here am I, send me, I'll do so. And He did so, hallelujah. <laughs> You're not going to get me uh, disturbed about my Lord. He must increase. The, even the very word must. D-E-I, D-E-I. Oh, preacher. And by the way, um, let me explain it this way. De I means of necessity. De I means it's got to be. Uh, De I means, and I may be going too far with this, no other way is going to suffice. No other, it's a must. 
He must increase. If we're going to live good, proper, fruitful Christian lives, He must, obligatory, He must increase. He must increase. Uh, increase. Let me give you that verb. It, it's oxano. A-U- A-U-X-A-N-O. Oxano. What does it mean? It means to augment. It means to grow. It means to be greater in, in uh, uh, quantitatively, qualitatively. It, it means, and uh, I, I just want to be sure, it is a present tense active voice verb. Jesus in Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and statue and favor with God and man. Jesus came to increase in holiness. He's perfect. Jesus came to increase in his deity. He is God, period. But he increased as he grew as a little lad and as he grew as a teenager and as he grew in the knowledge of the word of God, he must increase. But John's going further than that. He will increase in he will increase in uh, 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 being successful uh, in dying for the sin of the world. He will increase and become a resurrected savior. Then he will become a, a high priest of a savior, interceding for us. Then he'll become a returning again savior. Uh, then he'll become a rapturing of the church savior. And then he'll become a judgment seat of the Christ savior. He'll become the uh, the bridegroom of the living church savior. John's probably got the bridegroom of Israel in mind, God the Father, all the way through the Old Testament. He's the husband of Israel, but eventually Jesus, when the church, uh, he'll be uh, the bridegroom and we're the bride in the church. He must increase, but I, I must decrease. I must drink a lotto, a lotto. And what does a lotto mean? To make, I must become inferior I must become less. I must become lower. I must increase in my life, in my ego. I must in. I, I must decrease. Oh, let's talk about that for a moment. It's amazing. I think. Notice the order of the verbs. I guess you could make a case. Well, John, you, you really ought to say, I must decrease and then he must increase because he can't increase in your life till you've made room. I must. No, no. Holy Ghost says that's not it. That's not the way it works. Number one, he must increase. And as he gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more, and as I love him with increasing, then I will decrease. I will diminish. Uh, bigger he gets, the smaller in comparison to him we should become. Uh, this is proper humility. This is proper self abnegation. I'm nothing. In the, Jesus said it one day in John 15. He said, fellas, without me, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Without me, you got to abide in me if you're going to bear fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. John 15, John the Baptist has picked up on that reality and on that great truth. I must decrease. I am nothing. Let me, let me give you a verse out of Psalm 75, if I can possibly get it in. I believe I have time. The psalmist writes, Promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west, nor the south. I'll just be settled with the ministry God's given me. I'll be happy in the little corner where, where God has placed me. Promotion doesn't come from politics. Promotion doesn't come from going to the preacher's meetings. Promotion doesn't come. Promotion's neither from the... But God is the judge. God puts down one and sets up Another. A preacher put it this way one day. I liked it. He said, bloom where you are planted. Don't ask God to put you in another garden. Don't believe the grass is greener over you. Bloom where you're planted. Be satisfied with where God has placed you. Real humility just might be the result of letting Jesus get bigger and bigger and bigger in our lives. What a lesson from the precious Word of God to be applied with each of us. Jesus, may He increase.